Good evening. This is Beth Ann. I'm so glad to be with you again. I know it says Reverend Adeline Coleman, but those of you who know me, you know this is Beth Ann. <laughs> I have, I told you this before, I have a name that I go by. My legal name is Adeline, but I like Beth Ann now. And I like Adeline too. Okay. Nevertheless, we're glad to we're glad to be with you tonight. Oh, I thank God for this day, a day that He has made, and we're rejoicing and we're glad in it. I trust you're loving the Lord and have had and will continue to have a good day today. Um, our days are not good because of what happens necessarily. Because sometimes you can have some difficult moments that will strike your day. But if your faith is in the Lord Jesus, if you know that you are saved and he's your father, then, and listen here, and that all things work together for good to them that love him, you can have a good day. Sometimes you might cry, but it's still a good day. Sometimes you might face some difficult moments, it's still a good day. Sometimes you may not have lived up to your own expectations of what you want to be, but it's still a good day. Somebody may have slipped and fell and did something that was unchristlike. Get up, dust yourself off, ask God for forgiveness, repent, and have a good day. Listen, y'all, God loves us. And I, I don't say things like this to uh, encourage weakness, but rather to make you strong. Sometimes we make mistakes. We're not totally perfect yet. We're striving to get there. He is perfecting us. So if you kind of missed it a little bit today, you said something or did something that was not like Christ, just repent. Sincerely repent, but repent. Ask God for his forgiveness. Put a smile on your face and let the joy of the Lord rule your heart. Okay? Come on, we're going to study. We're starting a brand new study. We were talking about the 12 disciples. In this time that we've been studying uh, these lessons, oh, it's been a couple years now we've been doing this. And some of you have been with me all this time, and I thank God for you. Oh, yes, I do. Some of you joined in from the time we started, and you've hung in there with us, and I appreciate you so much. I don't think I've told you that for a while, but I really do appreciate you. Sometimes we were um, actually live and... My son, who's my director, producer, encourager, he does all of that. Uh, we had to make some adjustments to our scheduling because of his work schedule. But he's been so faithful standing with his mother and helping me along. And so I have to do things that will help him as well. So we start recording the sessions so that you can still get them at 7 o'clock. And so God is good. He makes a way. And I'm telling you, for me, I act like it's 7 o'clock at night and that we're just here, and I'm envisioning you being there. So even though some of these things are recorded, and it's recorded too so that the people on uh, YouTube can catch it, Facebook can catch it, and you know what's wonderful? If you miss it, you can come back and catch it again. I had a friend, matter of fact, a family member who said to me, my sister-in-law, she says, um, sometimes I miss it on Tuesday. But when I do my Bible study on Wednesdays, you're my Bible study. Oh, God is so good in the way that he prepares things for us. We started these, things, these lessons because of the pandemic. And we weren't able to get together. It was right after Bishop Blassingame died and we wanted to go ahead and do Holy Week service. And look what God has done. You know, I did not foresee all the things that he would do because of this. But God has a way, oh my goodness, 
He has a way of working and bringing things out just like he wants it to. And as we've been studying, we've started, we did some things. We started out with Holy Week so that we would do the Holy Week services. And then after that, so many of you wanted me to continue. So I just kept going and we started doing sermons of encouragement, getting us through the pandemic. Things are opening up a lot more than they were back then. Ah, and we've kept going. So we studied books of the Old Testament. We wanted to do, we, we started again after we did Holy Week, we were doing prayer and going through the, the Psalm 119. Remember we went through the whole 119 song? Oh, that was a good study. And then we decided to do some studying on the, the little short books. We did some in the Old Testament and we did Ruth. Uh, we went and did some of the short books in the New Testament, like Jude. And then we decided, well, let's do a character study. And as we begin to do a character study, we started with the 12 disciples. And that's where we've ended with the 12 disciples of the Lord Jesus. Oh, yeah, I didn't give you all of the study that we've done, but those were some of the highlights that we did. And so now after we did, did the character study on the 12 disciples, we just ended that in our last session, we wanted to talk a little bit about another character study. Sometimes when you do character studies, the point is the Bible says that these things were written for our example. So uh, we want to pick up on a woman, the character study of a woman. We did 12 men. Now we're going to look at this woman and the significance of this woman in Scripture. So you're going to need to get your Bible so you can follow along with us. And we're going to talk about the woman who's um, identified as the mother of our faith. No, I'm not talking about Eve. She's the mother of all living. But I'm talking about Abraham's wife, Sarah. We're going to do a character study on Sarah. Are you ready? We want to look at some strengths and some weaknesses and some things that we can learn from Sarah. So let's pray. I trust you're ready. Come on. Father, we thank you. We praise and honor you for this glorious day that you have given us. We bless your name. Father, we've come to study your word. It's only in your word that we live and move and have our being. We cannot do anything without you. We thank you that you have already promised us that your word never returns to you void. You said never, never returns to you void, but always accomplishes what you send it forth to accomplish. So we thank you because your word would not return to you void today. Your word would accomplish something in somebody's heart today. And so we thank you, Lord, because when we are faithfully teaching your word, You've promised us that you will confirm your word with signs and wonders. And that's what we ask you to do today in the name of Jesus. Lift somebody's heart. Send healing, body, soul, and spirit to someone today. As a result of this word, we pray it in Jesus' name. Amen. Come on, here's where we're going to start with Sarah. We've already told you that she was the wife of Abraham. So let's start at the very first book of the Bible. Let's go to Genesis, the book of beginnings. And we're going to start reading here in Genesis chapter, uh, where I'm going to start. We're going to start reading in Genesis chapter 11. Because as we look in the book of Genesis, what we find is that after God made Adam and Eve, this is benefit of those who need some background, uh, Sister Linda always tells us we have a habit of saying, and you know the story, and everybody may not know the story, <laughs> okay? I think sometimes because some of us have been around for a while, we know, but there's some people who are watching now or who may watch in the future who may not know the story. So those of you who know it, will you allow me, please, just to do a little background and bring everybody up to speed? Thank you. <laughs> Here, uh, God had created Adam and Eve, and we understand Adam sinned, uh, and they were put out of the garden. And the generations went from Adam 
Adam's sons, Cain and Abel and Seth. And the Bible lets us know he had other sons and daughters. And eventually we get to this man, Noah. And uh, it was under Noah that God destroyed the world uh, with a flood. And after the flood, we see that God is now saying to Noah, I want you to replenish. I want you to multiply and replenish the earth because everything uh, was gone. When I say everything, there was still land after the waters receded, but the people were gone. God only saved Noah, his wife, his three sons, and their wives. His three sons were Shem, Ham, and Japheth. And it was his son Shem who now uh, is the ancestor of Abraham. And when you look in the book of Genesis chapter 11, you see that after the flood, these people decided they were going to build this tower. We call it the Tower of Babel. And they were going to reach to heaven. And the Lord has said unless he did something, they were going to accomplish because they worked together. They had a mind to work together. And if he didn't stop them, they would nothing would be impossible for them. They would have been able to accomplish their goal because of the unity. That brings us back to diversity and men's unity. Okay. Uh, and so it is under this uh, understanding now that you have in chapter 11, the descendants... After you talk about the Tower of Babel, you see that there were descendants from there. And that you go down to about eight, eight or so generations. And this is sometimes where people don't like to read. Because it's this one begat and this one begat and this one begat. And all it means is that they had a son. And then in this chapter it says sons and daughters. But they give you the name of some of the children. They don't list all of the sons and daughters. And they tell you how old each person was when they had their first child. And how long they lived after they had that child. Now, lifespans were very long. Because you see, they're living 400 years or so. Uh, before Noah, the oldest man that ever lived, the Bible says, was Methuselah, an ancestor of Noah. And he lived 969 years. Oh, but the Bible says, but he died. He lived a long time, but he died. And every time I think of Methuselah's 969 years, I think of one day as a thousand years and a thousand years as one day. Uh, and it kind of makes me feel like Methuselah lived 969 years, but that's less than a day. Oh, our time system, the way we manage time and talk about time, it's kind of comical a little bit. He tells us to teach us to number our days. Okay, so I digress. Nonetheless, we see about eight generations coming down, eight to nine generations coming down from Noah, if you go back and count them. And you see that we're coming now to this man, Terah. Uh, when we look at verse 10, this is the account of Shem's family. Now remember, Shem was Noah's son. Uh, and it says, two years after the great flood, Shem was a hundred years old. And became the father of a faxon. Now, it, this is where the begats begun, be, begin. <laughs> so you go down and you see all of these sons and how old they are and who got, who was father to whom. And we keep going down till we get to about verse uh, 25. And it says, after Terah was 70 years old. He became the father of Abram, Nahor, and Haran. So these are Abram, Nahor, and Haran. We know we're going to find out that Abram uh, eventually becomes Abraham. We'll get to that a little bit later. But right now, he's Abram, and his brother is Nahor and Haran. And it says, this is the account of Terah's family. Terah was the father of Abram, Nahor, and Haran. And Haran was the father of Lot. But Haran died in Ur of the Chaldees, the land of his birth, while his father, Terah, was still living. 
Meanwhile, Abram and Nahor both marry. Now remember the three boys, okay? But one Lot's father dies. And so you have Abram and his brother, and they get married. And it says, Abram's wife was Sarai, and the name of Nahor's wife was Milcah. And Milcah and her sister Iscah were daughters of Nahor's brother Haran. But Sarah was unable to become pregnant and had no children. Now, here's the first mention of Sarah. And the first thing we see about Sarah, other than that she married Abram, is that she's barren. And that time for a woman not to have children was very sad. She was looked upon with pity, as if something was wrong with her. And these other women around Sarah are having children. Can you imagine how Sarah felt? Now notice it says that uh, where we read up here about Abram, uh, it says that his father, uh, let me see what verse I want. After Terah was 70, he became the father of Abram. He was 70 years old <laughs> before he had kids. When you think about this, it plays a part in this story. And so you see, Sarah, a little bit younger, we find out later she's a little bit younger than Abram. And if his father was 70 when he had him, you know, these people are getting to be kind of old. And it says to us that she was barren. And it's unfortunate, but let me say this. We, as we go through this, we're going to be picking up lesson tips. Here's something that Sarah didn't know. And at this time, Abram didn't know. But God had a plan. My first lesson I want to say to you. Sometimes disappointing things are present in your life. Things didn't go the way you wanted them to. But can you grab this? God has a plan. You may think it's a horrible thing that's happening to you. You may feel disappointment, disillusion, upset, angry. But can I encourage you and tell you God has a plan for your life. Will you trust God's plan for your life? Yes, Sarah has a husband that loves her. And in the midst of your disappointing circumstances, there are some things that's good. Your life isn't all bad. You can say, well, you don't know my life. Listen, you are alive. And as long as you are alive, God is not through with you. Oh, you may have messed up some things. And it may not look good for you right now. Oh, but I want to share with somebody, God got it under control. He has a plan for you. Don't despise the difficulties of your life. Don't despise the disappointing things in your life. God loves you and has a plan. Can you trust his plan? It may not look good right now, but it's going to turn out all right. Let's follow Sarah's life and see how things go. It says, one day Terah took his son. This is uh, verse 31, chapter 11 of Genesis. He took his son, Abram, his daughter-in-law, Sarai, his son, his son, Abram's wife, 
and his grandson Lot, his sons Aaron's children, and moved away from Ur of the Chaldees and headed toward the land of Canaan, but they stopped at Haran and settled there. Then Abraham's father Terah lived for 205 years and he died while in Haran. And Sarah is still barren. Now, we move over into chapter 12. The Lord had said to Abram, leave your native country, your relatives, your father's family, and go to a land that I will show you. I will make you into a great nation. I will bless you and make you famous. And you will be a blessing to others. I'm reading out of the NLT. I will bless those that bless you and curse those who curse you. I will curse those who treat you with contempt. All the families of the earth will be blessed through you. So, Abram departed as the Lord had instructed, and Lot went with him, and Abram was 75 years old when he left Haran. Ah. <sighs> he left Ur with his dad, and his father dies. And now Abraham is 75 years old and no children. Sarah is barren. Sarah, Abraham's wife, is barren. You know what I thought? I was thinking to myself, putting myself in Sarah's place, trying to figure out how she might have felt. With her being barren, I don't know if Sarah wondered, is it my fault or is it Abraham's? Because he doesn't have any children. Sometimes we tend to blame other people for our misfortune. This is conjecture on my part. Because she's barren. That means she's not having any kids. I don't know if Sarah knew why she was barren. You know, they had a custom, the place where they came from, they worshiped idols. And God called Abraham out from that to make him a great nation. But because he's married to Sarai, uh, She's connected to her husband. What we see here, what I see to Sarah, Sarah I'll say Sarai, is an obedience to follow her husband. Okay, I'm not going to get too specific. I'm just going to stick to obedience. <laughs> okay. She's obediently following him. She's recognizing authority. She's recognizing, I will do what my husband says. Ooh. Ladies, stick with me. Don't leave me. Hold on. When you have a man that's listening to God, and I understand all of you are not married. Just give me a space. I'll get to you. And he's following God. Don't make it difficult for him. Work with him. It would have been very difficult, I would think, for Sarah to leave everything behind. I think it wasn't so easy for Abram. But they did it. And they did it together. The instruction from God came to Abram. But Abram is connected to Sarai. 
the two, uh-huh, become one. And so sometimes you have to understand that when there is unity, you have to follow the leading of the person who has been placed in position to lead. Are y'all still with me? <laughs> and Sarah is going along and we see no indication that she is objecting. What we see is that she's being obedient. And she's following her husband. And so we go to here and it says, And Sarah, he took Sarah, his nephew Lot, and all his wealth, the livestock and all the people he had taken, um, livestock and all the people he had taken into his household at Haran and headed for the land of Canaan. When they arrived in Canaan, Abram traveled through the land as far as Shechem. There he set up camp beside the Oak of Moreh. And at that time, the area was inhabited by the Canaanites. Where is Sarah? Right there. Going along, being obedient. Then the Lord appeared to Abram and said, Now look here. This is the second time God is saying something. I will give this land to you and your descendants. And there Abraham built an altar and dedicated it to the Lord who had appeared to him. And after that, Abraham traveled south and set up camp. Sarah's right here. I know we're talking about Sarah, so stay with me. Traveled south to the camp in the hill country uh, with Bethel to the west and Ai to the east. And there he built another altar <laughs> and dedicated it to the Lord. And he worshiped the Lord. I believe that when it's talking about Abraham worshiping the Lord, Sarah was right there. She's his wife. She's going along with him. And Abram continued traveling south by stages toward the Negev. And at that time, look at God. Sarah is barren, but she's going along. She's following her husband. She's being obedient to him. It says, and at that time, a severe famine struck the land of Canaan, forcing Abram to go down to Egypt. What is Sarah doing? Following. Obediently following. And there in Egypt, he lived as a foreigner. And as he was approaching the border of Egypt, Abram said to his wife, Sarai, look, you are a very beautiful woman. Oh, my goodness. I think Sarah knew she looked good. But isn't it nice to hear somebody tell you you look good? You, you look in the mirror, you see yourself, you know. But when somebody tell you, oh, I like that. That looks nice on you. You're pretty. It does make you feel good. Stop it. Y'all know it makes you feel good. <laughs> Especially if your husband is telling you, yeah, it makes you feel good. But those of you who aren't married, you'd like for somebody to tell you you look nice, that you're pretty. And there's nothing wrong with that. I need us to understand this. That you are fearfully and wonderfully made. Here's another lesson. Y'all got this one, number two? Even if you don't have what you want, God still loves you. And you can still look good. Oh, Sarah is barren, but she's pretty. <laughs> you may say to yourself, oh, I don't have this and I don't have that. And oh, this ain't going my way and that ain't right for me. But look at what you do have. Sarah didn't have children, but she had good looks. Or you may say, well, good looks don't... Well, it depends on how you look at it. What's your perspective? I look good, and she's not a young woman. And, and Abraham is saying, you're so pretty. Look what he's saying. You're so pretty that when the Egyptians see you, they will say, 
This is his wife. Let's kill him. Then we can have her. So please tell them you are my sister. Then they will spare my life and treat me well because of their interest in you. He says, Sarah, it's because of you. You can keep me alive. You can spare my life. Listen, can I tell you something? What God has given you, whatever it is, God can use whatever that gift is that he's given you to save somebody's life. That's a good lesson to learn from Sarah. It might have been Sarah's beauty, but it might be your kindness. It might be the fact that you are a helper, that you know how to encourage, that you know how to lift somebody up. And God will use that to save the life of somebody. Oh, the thing that you think is not important. You have a gift, you have a talent that God has given to you, not just for you to keep to yourself, but to save somebody's life. I want you to think about what you have. It was Sarah's good looks. What is it that you have? You don't have to be drop down gorgeous. But you know one of the things that I learned as a young woman coming up? I read the scripture and it says that God will beautify the meat. If you stay humble, the Bible, we, we, we'll hit it a little bit later as we go down. There is the quality of a meek and a quiet spirit. I'm talking to women on that, but it's good for men as well. There is a quality of humility that makes you look good. Sometimes people are looking at physical attractiveness and because they have this outer beauty, but a nasty disposition, it affects their beauty. But if you don't have the right symmetrical, you know, numbers, but you're sweet, your personality is good, you use your brains, oh yeah, you're pretty, you look good. And you can say, well, you know, my, my, my eyes might not be blue, they're brown, but somebody likes brown eyes. Oh, my hair might not be long, it's short, but somebody likes short hair. Oh, my hair may not be black, it's turning white. Let me tell you something, some people like white hair. Don't despise what God has given you. You have something to offer to somebody. Oh, everybody may not know it, but somebody, life is going to be spared. Oh! somebody's life is going to be saved because they came in contact with you. God placed you in the right place at the right time to save somebody's life. Whew. God, I'm sure, because he is the omniscient God, the all-powerful God, he allowed this famine to take place in order to get Abraham to Egypt. To get Abram in Egypt, he got Sarah in Egypt. Now, Abraham is saying, tell them that you're my sister. This is not the only time this happens to Abram. It happens some years down the road from this point. And this is how we find out that Sarah is actually, you're going to find this in the 20th chapter, she is Abram's sister. They have uh, the same father, but not the same mother. So you can say it's his half-sister. Well, at that time in history, you were allowed to marry your half-sister. you got to remember that these eight generations after the flood, the earth is being replenished. So God will use different things at different times. Later on, we'll find in the, big, in the book of Leviticus, he forbade doing that. He allowed it for this time because of the circumstances and the situation that the earth was in. 
But then years later, under Levitical law, he says, I don't want you marrying your half-sister. But this time, he allowed it. Our time is up. Here you see Sarah obedient to what Abraham's request is. Abraham's request. Tell them you're my sister and save my life. And she goes along with it. Sure enough, when Abram arrived in Egypt, everyone noticed Sarah's beauty. Everyone noticed it. When the palace officials saw her, they sang her praises to Pharaoh, their king, and Sarah was taken into his palace. Then, watch this, then Pharaoh gave Abram many gifts. Why? Because of Sarah. I tell you, she saved her husband's life. She saved their companions, their traveling people, their family, saved their lives and got blessings because she obeyed. Obedience is a wonderful thing. These are some, I told you these things happen for our example. When you look at Sarah, don't just see Abram, see Sarah. She was obedient. And twice so far, it says, and because of Sarah, and because of Sarah, because of Sarah, God's doing some things because of you. Some people may have put you down, but because you obey God, because you walk with God, because you follow God, you're going to save somebody's life. You're going to be a blessing to someone else. Yo, we got to quit. We're going to come back with some more about Sarah. We're going to look at some of her weaknesses and some of her strengths. And we're going to pick up some lessons as we go through this. Uh, we're not all perfect and neither was she. But there's some good stuff about Sarah's life. We're going to finish our character study on Sarah when we come back the next time. Good night.